Without a doubt, these are incredible, impactful technologies that allow for greater accessibility. We'd like to thank Ricardo and all of our panelists for sharing their incredible work. The session has really shown how technology is a tool for the full and effective inclusion of all. Up next, we have our impact transfer session. It's a joint initiative between the ESSEL Foundation, Fundación Descubreme, and Ashoka that seeks out the most innovative practices every year and helps replicate them around the world. We will hear now from three graduates of the program who want to grow their initiatives in Latin America, Spain, and throughout the Spanish-speaking world. The panel will be moderated by Cesarina Nicolai, a consultant with Ashoka and head of the program for the past two years. We'll also hear from three different initiatives. First, Hiking Without Limits from Fundación Eres, a Chilean foundation that has created inclusive unicycles that can take people with disabilities into natural areas that would be inaccessible otherwise. We'll also hear from the program World Around You by RIT. It's an online library that provides high quality reading materials in sign language and written language for deaf people and their families. We'll also hear from Up and Town Companion, which allows people with reduced mobility to use public transport in an autonomous and independent way. You can learn more about them now. If we both are the night could be I could be free. Hola y bienvenidos a la a la sesión de impact. Welcome to this session. Good morning, good afternoon. It depends on which place in the world you're connecting with us. I am Cesarina Nicolaia. I'm the moderator of this session, and I'm the general of the project, of the Zero Project. It's a program that is um, designed between Zero Project and Fundación Descubreme. I am blonde, I am, have blue eyes, and I'm wearing a purple uh, blouse and a black jacket. It's a great pleasure for me to share this space with three social innovations that are very important. One is impact transfer. And the purpose of today is to provide a space for them so they can share their work, their replication of plans in the world, in the Spanish-speaking world. And all of them have the goal to reach the whole world. And today they are going to share their work and also they are going to share their learnings in this uh, replication process that has not been easy. Today we are going to be focused in their job and before presenting them, I can tell you a little bit more about the impact transfer project for those who don't know about it. The program started five years ago and ever since we've we working with 51 people from 26 countries and we have all the continents covered and uh, working in different ways to make the world for people with disabilities a better place. We've seen incredible works from Ethiopia, from the United States, India, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and we want to see more projects. And today we are about to take another step with Latin America. And in this session, we are going to start with the presentations. And also then we will have a panel in which the speakers will share their learning uh, learnings. And within the panel, if you may have any question, please ask questions and you please be connected with us. This is my presentation and now I want to give the floor to our first uh, speaker today, Faustino Cuadrado from, and who is going to talk about how they use, how they have created this accessibility for, for transportation for people with disabilities. Uh, 
Ya, yeah. buenos, buenos días y buenas tardes a todos. Perdonad, no había desactivado ¿no? el mute. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting us to this great session. Thank you, Chesalina, for your presentation. I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Bueno, soy, no, perdón, he eh, olvidado decir que soy un hombre de 50. Eh, Morepén, los pelo moreno, ojos negros y que voy llevando una camisa a cuadros azul o algo así. Soy, soy alto, amigo también. Bueno, hoy, como os decía Cesarina, vamos a hablar de Apanta un Compañón. Es un sistema, es un, trans, un sistema de transporte asistido que permite a personas con discapacidad o personas mayores utilizar el transporte público de manera autónoma. La empresa, como bien había dicho Cesarina anteriormente, el nombre de la empresa es más. We are one, the name of our company is Mass Factory, and we are based in Barcelona. And we have tried to create products that have a very large social impact. It's one of the most important things we are, think, that we look for as a universal divine. We, we want it to be able to reach the greatest number of people possible. And it's also products we want to develop are things that work towards social fare, welfare, applying the concept of a smart city. As I say, the name of our company is Mass Factory, but what we are developing here is the App and Town Companion. As the OMS has already said, it, it, since 2010, we have said that the limit to public transport is one of the most important causes of exclusion and discrimination. It limits the mobility of people with disabilities and creates very uh, broad vulnerability. So they, they find that there are inadequate numbers of adapted vehicles. They follow very strict uh, routes and uh, times and they're neither inclusive nor sustainable. They don't allow the population to be able to travel together. For example, the uh, people with disabilities aren't able to ride on the same transport as their family members. The vehicles have not been adapted because they, they are only used for very small populations, but most of these people aren't able to use them when they want to travel with their family member or when what happens if your family member isn't able to take that same route that you would like to travel on? What happens if there is an adapted vehicle available? That's These are some of the greatest issues that we're seeing. So people with disabilities ultimately end up staying in their home and they're left out of the equation. So. We're working so that all types of people, regardless of what type of disability they have, are able to use transport. They're facing all these accessibility barriers. We can talk about people who might have physical disabilities or sensorial disabilities that might face architectural or guidance issues. If we're talking about people with cognitive disabilities, they might have issues with guidance systems, with orientation, with communication. Or if we pe have people who have uh, mental impairments or memory impairments, they also might need those communication or guidance. So there are people who also have to overcome all of these barriers, architectural orientation and communication barriers. So what is the solution? App and Town Companion. It's an innovative system for door-to-door -door navigation to help people with reduced mobility use public transport in an autonomous manner. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the different aspects of our transport. Let's have a look at this video. We've got someone who is listening to the guidance system to tell him to, when to get off the bus. He needs to get off at the next stop. 
So he, sorry, he's been told that he has three stops left to go to get up. And it's now telling him to get off at the next stop. He has suppressed the button to ask for the bus to stop. And it's now telling him to cross the street and follow the train. There's a bit of an issue. So he has called for guidance. They're asking him if he is OK. He says, look, I can see that you need to turn around and go in the opposite direction. You're on the Cosmodome Street. You need to turn around and go back a few bit. OK, so I have to go back another direction. Yes. You're going to go to the corner. OK, thank you very much. And I have to keep going right until the door. And here I am. I've arrived at my destination. How can we make sure that our users are able to travel on their own? We've tried to eliminate the use of a route, use a route planner so that users and assistants can select the transport, the lines, or their exchanges there between lines that they prefer to use. They can also use the app to be able to finish or extend their trip walking. They can get the information on the grade of the land that they're going to be passing over, the uh, dangers that may encounter construction. They can see where are the pedestrian uh, crossings, and they can receive personalized instructions. The barriers to guidance and communication are overcome using the mobile phone of the user, which will provide guided indications using a universal design that is adapted to all of the needs of the user. These might be audio, text, uh, graphics, images, vibrations, uh, notifications, and maps. But it also can send information to our system so that we can see where the user is at their journey and so we can see if they're having any issues. That helps the user to arrive at their destination. It's not just the mobile app, but also the information that tells them how to get to the next step. Then if there's any incident on their journey, someone is observing that user, they can detect that there's an issue and get into contact so they can orient them. As we saw in the video, someone called Benjamin and told him how, how he needed to change his, uh, his direction so that he could arrive at his destination. And so we can make sure that regardless of an incident along the way where our users get to their destination. So we have the operators, we have that part of the observation of journeys that can track the, the trips and we can provide that remote assistance. The person, the assistant will provide any additional information that they need during their trip. And they can provide that, as we saw in the video, we can provide a remote phone call to help. We have a network of volunteers in this city that are providing this uh, remote assistance. The impact for a system is twofold. There's a social impact because we have been able to increase the number of users who are taking more trips and more complex trips. The, the, and their family members and carers know that there is someone who is overseeing these journeys and helping them get to their destinations. And there's also an economic impact because it has really helped to reduce the costs of travel for the families. And also, they've been the public uh, arm of transport has been able to replace a lot of these adapted vehicles with use of their public vehicles. We have more than 500 users in the system in Barcelona, Madrid, Malaga, Vigo in Spain, and in Longoy in Canada. Our clients are, because we work in public transport, mobile, we work with transport authorities and operators and organizations for people with disabilities. Our model is based on 
a licensed system. It's an SAS model. So they pay an annual fee for a license. Our objective is to replicate the plan. There are several areas that if the conditions can be met, we would like to be able to expand it in the transport, public transport systems. We need to be able to strengthen the transport systems to make sure that they're able to work with our system. We're looking to build more alliances with organizations for people with disabilities and transport authorities and operators. The system has been recognized by different organizations. We were recognized by Zero Project this year. And we've also been recognized by Red Cross, Vodafone, and different organizations throughout the world. But for us, the most important thing is what do users have to say about our system? It is a user with a visual impairment, and she says that she feels very safe when she is traveling using Up and Town Companion. And so it is great to hear what she has to say about this system. I'd like to invite you to visit any of these media who have uh, greater information. We've uh, carried out different interviews with them. And if you have any questions, you can get in touch with me and hopefully we will have time for a question and answer after the end of the panel. Thank you so much, Faustino, for presenting us this wonderful program and that is very important for making the accessibility to transportation much easier and from Spain uh, where Faustino is we are going to the United States but also a combination United States and Europe and it's a pleasure for me to introduce Christopher Kurtz and he is going to work with uh, who is going to present world around you. He is going to use North American language system or sign language. Hello. I really want to thank you for welcoming us and inviting us here to present and uh, Thomas Dean is here to be providing English uh, translation. The two of us, however, work together on this project. We're very excited to share our work with you that what we've done to date, and we're hoping to look forward to developing new partnerships in the future. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. So I am a professor at Rochester Institute of Technology, and we have about 1,500 deaf and hard of hearing undergraduate to doctoral level students at my university. I am focused on a teacher training, specifically in trying to promote literacy amongst deaf, young deaf children around the world. And Thomas Steen, my colleague here, is assistant dean, and she is also the director of the Center for International Educational Outreach, who also partners with a variety of countries to do deaf education focused projects. The two of us today are thrilled to present our project called World Around You, or WAY. So I want you to spend a moment with me thinking about what's happening around the world with deaf children and their experiences. Around the world, there's about 34 million deaf children. But amongst those 34 million deaf children, really only about 2% of them have access to language. So 
2% of all deaf children really have access to either written language or spoken language. That is a very small percentage of the total number of children. And so we know from research that access to language is critical in order to provide good quality of life, to help children get through their education, to get jobs and to live independently. So people really ask why 2%, that is so low. And really the reasons are, there's a variety of reasons. There's political reasons, there's policy decision reasons, uh, there's lack of access to education, and there's a lack of access to stories. So because so few deaf children have access to written, written materials and uh, stories, that means that they have low literacy rates. And if they are not able to read or write, that leads to family isolation, low quality of life, and poor uh, living outcomes overall. And it means that these children could either be completely illiterate or have low literacy, which means they might have basic uh, ability to read, but they may not be able to have many options for their employment and jobs because they don't have access. So understanding the significance of that challenge, we really wanted to address the grand challenge for improving children's literacy. So it really is to a uh, grand challenge for reading and it was to involve a technological solution to promote literacy. We submitted a proposal for that competition and we won uh, some funds and that was how we developed this platform World Around You Way. And at the beginning we started with the Philippines as our first country and now we've expanded to several other countries over the last two and a half years. The platform itself is called World Around You, and it includes several components. First, it is a completely open source platform that is available on the web, and that means that different communities can contribute content onto this platform. And members of the community can be many different individuals. It can be sign storytellers, it can be illustrators or authors, and all of those people work together to create the stories for the platform. In addition, this project also involves the importance of distributing not the values and knowledge of local communities and written information and sign language information of that in stories. And it really helps with children developing their self-esteem and self-confidence. This platform can also be used with families to help them and their homes develop shared reading with their children as well as in schools. And the third component of the platform involves uh, details on how to develop content like stories for the platform, shared reading resources, and all together, we have a digital online library with a number of stories in a variety of languages. And it is web-based and the training is up in order to create stories is also available in this platform. On this slide, I'm showing what the what platform looks like. On the left side is the reader interface, and it has all the online library of stories, and they will appear on this interface. The reader can then choose which language they want to view for each story. And, and they will have a written language component, as well as a sign language component for each story. And the reader can choose each of those for whatever language they prefer to view the story in. And then in that interface, we created it based on field testing with the deaf community in the Philippines and also with school teachers there. Now, what's unique about this platform is it's not like YouTube. If you watch a video on one of those platforms, you can see that the reader must 
try to watch the captions and view signs simultaneously. However, our platform is designed so that you can um, change your attention and the story is, the sign languages are looped so that you can continue to view it and you can also read the captions independently. So it gives the reader much more control over how they're viewing the materials. It also has the a feature to flip pages as if you're using a real book. On the right side, these are images of the creator interface. And on the author uh, and creator interface, there are tools in order to build. And you can either contribute to any story or create new stories on the back end of our platform. It is a very simple and easy to use interface in order to upload stories, to upload printed text. You can also add glossary or key terms, the vocabulary that deaf children want to learn from reading each of the stories. So to date, our strategy has really been focused on developing partnerships in different countries. We've talked about their values related to developing reading and writing skills and providing support for that, identifying community members who can be involved. And we emphasize the importance of having deaf community members involved in all the decision-making uh, parts of this process. Because we really believe in empowering the communities in how they develop and share their stories and that they collaborate with others so that really later on they can take it on and become self-sufficient. The platform itself, again, is open source and has open licensing. So that means anyone who is using this in any country can go, feel free to make edits and create new content for this platform. Through our partnerships, we also want to identify and create best practices and gold standards related to the story development. Every country has at least one or more unique languages. And so we wanna make sure that we do have some consistency in the production of the stories. Through our training, it helps the communities self-reflect and compare between their own languages and the languages of other countries. And in addition, part of our strategy is to work with each of the communities to help them become self-sufficient in maintaining and continuing to grow the platform for their own use. And we want them to be able to continue to grow and contribute stories and develop literacy tools for the online library. So up to this point, we've worked with six different countries, mostly in Southeast Asia. We've developed a large pool of over 7,000 users for our platform. And now deaf people are really stepping forward and realizing that they too can be creators and illustrators as a part of creating a new content for the library. And through these stories, it means that we can also distribute and raise awareness to deaf children through social media. One significant impact we noticed was that we had a deaf child in the Philippines on the island of Bahal. She was about nine years old and she was looking at the stories from the team and, they, and then young deaf girl said, now I can see myself creating my own stories for the platform. Now these deaf children are seeing their role models and other deaf people with similar experiences. And it really increased her self-esteem. Self it was a really powerful story. We also have parents involved and children involved, and we're doing what we call family visits, where we are showing the, the platform and how to use the stories, the technology, and showing them some of the best practices with shared reading or reading together between the parents and their deaf children. And over these next several months, we will be collecting data from these family visits to better inform our practices moving forward. 
So our future goal is really to continue replicating it. And we really want to replicate and focus on specifically South American countries, Chile and Colombia, to help expand the WAVE platform. We want to learn how to partner with the, in these countries in order to spread awareness to the deaf community and to deaf children. We want to partner with deaf associations and schools that teach uh, young children and get parents involved to create um, stories and be interested in contributing to our platform. So please contact with us if you're interested, if you have any questions, we really look forward to hope it and hope to work with you in the future. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris and Tommy, for that wonderful presentation. <laughs> Sorry, we've. Uh... Thank you very much for your presentation. It's really such a wonderful thing that you're doing for your children and their families. We're going to move on to our next presentation, which is Glenda from Glenda Duran. She is the founder of Fundación Eres in Chile. And she's going to present her program, Hiking Without Limits. Please go ahead, Glenda. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, to have been invited to this event. And to be able to share this space with such important presentations. My presentation is going to the end, but we're going to resolve the issue and moving into the presentation. I'd like to welcome all of you to our presentation on Hiking Without Limits. My name is Glenda Duran. As Cesarina said, I am the president and founder of the Fundación Eres. I'm a mother to six children. I'm a teacher as well. One of my children is disabled. We are the Fundación Eres, and we work for the rights of people with disabilities and their families. And the program that we're going to present today is Hiking Without Limits. It's a program that offers different solutions to the accessibility to nature, to the barriers that are faced by people with disabilities. We know that nature offers so many healthful aspects. A space that improves our quality of life. And yet we know that it's very difficult to access nature for different reasons. It's that is why, as a foundation, they, we designed Hiking Without Limits, which is a program that allows all people, without regard to any condition, they can uh, enjoy all parks and open nature. We have undertaken several actions within our program. We have developed a unicycle, and we use this to carry out inclusive excursions into nature. We train different teams to work with us, and we have also used it as a job opportunity. Here you can see some of the characteristics of our unicycles. It is operated by two or more people, it's very intuitive. It's made and produced here in Chile. As you can see in the image, you can see one of the excursions that we have made in one of the parks in the city of Santiago with a large number of volunteers in the picture as well. As we said, the UNICEF is made locally and it allows us to carry out these excursions in a very safe way to really enjoy nature. In the image that you're seeing on the screen, you can appreciate that we have Rodrigo, uh, one of the beneficiaries of the program and one of our volunteers who are enjoying this inclusive experience. 
it's a really an experience that really builds inclusion, links, and wealth, uh, well-being among all of our users and volunteers. Our, the trails that we use have been adapted. There are several different accessible materials, but we have also made sure to show all of the flora and fauna and make sure that is, everything is accessible so that everyone can really have an enjoyable experience that is accessible to all. We also make sure to have specially design more materials so that everyone can really enjoy that. They can have a full uh, self-care experience, especially after the pandemic. We've also paired out different analysis and design and adaptation of the excursions and trails that we use. In terms of training, the program is really dedicating its training to tourism operators and teams and volunteers. We've been able to train several park rangers as well, but we really want to train people with disabilities themselves. As you can see on the right, we have one of our young volunteers who trained with us and is now a hiking monitor. What is our dream? Our seal our stamp of, is that we want to be feasible we want to be not have to make any interventions into nature we want people to be able to enjoy all the parts we want to be able to co-create improvements and trails that will allow everyone to participate we want more people to become part of our teams, but we really want to focus on people with disabilities. We have a 90% satisfactory rating from our users. And we have worked in partnership with the Forestry Association of Chile, and we are looking to carry out more opportunities for hiking without limits and in, uh, increase the number of territories throughout Chile. What are we looking for? We want to build alliances. We want to find more partners who want to be part of this project, whether they're from the public or private sectors, if parks. We want organizations that work with and for people with disabilities. We are working, as we say, with the Tourism Association here in Chile. We are expanding throughout the Chile. We want to find more partners who want to be part of these two models, an implementation model that means getting more of the unicycles, training uh, more guides to carry out the activities, and also to build that shared philosophy of the program. We also want to replicate our model. We want to train the trainers. We want to expand into other territories with more trained people who are able to develop the programs in their own areas. We need to work together. We want to grow together so that every day more and more people with disabilities can enjoy nature. It's an invite to co-create more programs with us. Here, I will leave all of our contact details. We hope that you can put, get your, in touch with us so that we can together make this world more accessible for all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Glenda, for your presentation. I want to go to see the nature now after your presentation, but we are here and thank you again to everybody. Now we are going to start with the panel. And after this session, after listening to these three organizations, we will have a very good opportunity co to cooperate, as you can see. And now to learn a little bit more about their uh, journey, uh, about the replication path they are going to follow, and they all have that experience. And my first question to all of you is, When did you decide to replicate these, either to go to another country or to another region? 
what was the main challenge you faced or what was one of the challenges that you faced that you overcame? If we could start with Faustino, please. It's a very good question, and I think it's a challenge that we face on a daily basis. In our case, the greatest challenge when replicating our model is to know the transportation, the assistive transportation system of the region, of the country, of the municipalities. And that's what makes it more difficult when you replicate the model, not the model itself, because uh, it's very simple. It's an, uh, an ap application that has no technological complexities, but the complexity is how the service can be included in the assistive transportation system of that municipality, of that region, of that country. And I think that's the greatest challenge that we face when we uh, want to replicate this in a new area. Thank you, Faustino. For So it's the knowledge of the area, right? Chris. This is Chris speaking. For us, one of the largest challenges related to the replication was because we just started our project replication right before COVID happened. And so we had initially planned to do in-country on-site training and work with the local communities in person. And so then when the pandemic happened, we had to shift to conducting everything remotely. And really, the deaf community is very the type of uh, engaging experience where they really like to be in person and interact with each other. But for the mid midterm, we had to do everything remotely. And therefore, we also had to meet work more frequently, and we had to have more ongoing engagement to ensure that things were progressing. And then we also had some unique challenges related to translation and working with different stakeholders and trying to discuss how to address each of those challenges. But one of the greatest benefits that we saw was that because we did some international collaborations through six countries, now it allowed all of those different leaders to meet with each other and see all of their own unique uh, contacts and their unique challenges and what's working effectively in each of their countries. And then they were able to exchange that information with each other. And I think that gave a lot more support uh, to the development of their projects. And I was very impressed with that. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias, Chris. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Yes, before pan pandemic, we can imagine that. Glenda, we're going to continue with you. At the beginning, I think the most difficult part was to change culture, to allow allow yourself to think that this is possible, that it is necessary to make changes, and that these changes are not so expensive in economic terms or the capacities that we had to develop. So the expectations of people, the expectations uh, companies or organizations have are below the possibility of progressing um, fastly. But once you live the experience, the perception changes. And that is so important because from the experience, we transform culture and we can also show that it is possible and that people feel so satisfied and they feel so happy. And we've been working on this in different, um, from different uh, views. And in Chile, this cultural transformation or this cultural change, it's something that we are all considering because we think that's where 
we will improve uh, all these uh, issues about accessibility and inclusion. Yes, if we see the groups, we talk about knowledge, we talk about culture, we talk about technology. But what we have heard about all of you is that there are different uh, challenges, big challenges, and at a certain point when you want to make a change, there, are, there might be some um, surprises or, or there might be some expectations as well. So as you know, this replication uh, road or path is not easy at all. I wanted to ask you, what's your motivation uh, when you face these uh, challenges which are different on every place you go or visit? Yes, yes. Yes. I'll start then. Sometimes more than motivation, it can be that like you're stubborn. As Blenda mentioned, it's a matter of seeing the reaction of users. You are um, like touching. That's the main motivation because life changes for them. Because in this project of Fundación Eres is incredible that people with such uh, with, uh, with a serious disability may enjoy nature, and in our case, it, we, we're talking about the urban area, so people can move around the urban areas, and also for people who are working with deaf uh, children and in through education and change their lives. So what motivates us, uh, I think what pushes us is this uh, conviction of reaching a lot of people with a solution that improves their qualities of lives. It does not only impact them, but the society, and that's the most important part. Thank you. Faustino, thank you. Glenda, for you. Yes, I share what Faustino has just mentioned. The motivation is the common uh, well, the common good, the uh, social justice, the participation of everybody in all these spaces. I think this is about rights. I think it's a responsibility that we all work and we offer our skills, our capacities, our knowledge, so we all have a better quality of life. And that is something that we cannot argue about. And that strengthens us and it anchors the need of working together and on a permanent basis. Very good energy. That's an inspiration for all of us. Chris. Really, what motivates me is just making sure that there's access for deaf children to stories. I think that's really motivating to me because so many deaf children just don't have access to any stories until much later in life. By exposing the children to stories earlier, it helps them develop their skills. It helps them develop life skills. It helps them develop understanding of other people. It helps them to understand culture. And also, it really helps promote the involvement of deaf characters. And, and these stories are written by deaf authors as well. I just want to share one interesting experience that I had in the Philippines. I was asked to give a presentation to a group of about 120 trained teachers of the deaf in Manila. And during that presentation, we showed them what the Manila deaf community had done to develop stories. And we showed one of the stories to the teachers. And so the teachers watched the story and then I said, this was, the story was created and developed by a deaf Filipino. And the teachers were just shocked. They said, 
this can't be, it's impossible. So these teachers had very low expectations. And so through that, we showed them and elevated that the deaf community really can. And we, by having them involved in this process, we were able to highlight the skills that deaf community members have. And so we really find that it's important that deaf community members be involved and that they can share this work with many others. Thank you. Gracias. Um, Thank you. And all of you talk about the impact, the rights, people, inclusion, working with uh, people within your model. All of you have something else in common, which is working with partners. You have worked. Uh, your models include different uh, partners. And I wanted to ask you, what is important for you when you start with a new partnership? Uh, how does this work? How, how do you know this is good for my organization? This is going to impact others. And if you like to begin. Linda, you're, you're in mute. There we go. Generally speaking, when we seek out new partnerships and alliances, we want to see that it, we can indicate the, the proposal. What is it that motivates us? Make sure that we're working towards the same implicit pur purpose. And we want to make sure that we're providing a service that is for the common good. I think it's something that we need to be able to show. But we also think that the best way to create ties and links is by making our partners live the experience. When they see the experience, they can understand beyond just the sort of the intellectual capacity, but it's those emotions, the empathy, those bonds that we build so that they want to build together. We always work on the premise that we can work together. We work together to create things together. And that allows us to generate less energy requirements on behalf of everyone. But when we work together, and put our energies together, we can achieve all of our objectives. To show someone with a disability this excursion and to see the satisfaction, to see the impact that it has, it has more of an impact on our par potential partners than the language. Living the experience is an excellent way for us to captivate our, our potential partners. Okay, thank you. And finally, Chris, we'll go to you. When we initially start talking with potential partners, one of the things that we feel is very important is to share our values with one another. We want to make sure that we have a similar understanding, similar goals for how we want to support deaf children and how they, we want to make sure that they are committed in terms of investing their time and energy to the project. And one of the biggest challenges that we faced is that all these stories are free. And so we are following the Creative Commons licensing, which means all the stories that must be available at no charge. And so that means that everyone just has to be committed to investing in not only the creation of the stories, but distributing them as well. And we want to keep it free because keep it free. We want to make sure that deaf children and their parents have access and to teachers also and other communities. And so that that way they can feel they're more involved and also can be committed because there's no cost to them. Okay. Yeah, 
por lo que veamos, queremos el empezar de vivir, experimentar. I think when we begin to live these experiences and experience, we all feel that level of commitment. So I think that's very important. I'd love to continue this conversation, but I know that we have a time limit. So I think we'll go to any closing comments that you might have. What is the takeaway? What is What would you like to share with all of the organizations that want to replicate your your impacts, your efforts, if we can go through it. If perhaps each of you can give a little takeaway from today. Who would like to begin? First. Well, I think my first recommendation is that you need to understand the possibilities for replication. Not all experiences can be re re replicated in all areas. So you need to dedicate time to analysis that we might have to do our project in a different way in different places. So you have to carry out that initial analysis. So that would be my takeaway. Okay. And then, uh, uh, what about you, Glenda? I'd like to add to his suggestion is to never forget about your purpose. You have to understand that there are ups and downs in life, but as we work together and we invest the best of ourselves, we will really be able to see a full inclusion of everyone. It's so important. And so my invite to you is to really understand the difficulties, understand that those difficulties are part of the process, seek out alliances and partnerships and continue to keep your purpose in mind. And then we'll hear from Chris. And I would like to just add nothing about us without us. We really need to make sure that we invest and empower people with disabilities to make sure that they are involved in every part of the process and in every aspect of decision-making along the way. We're not doing it for them, we do it with them. I think that is the most critical advice I could give. Thank you very much, everyone. And we do this with you. And so I think to close for today, I'd like to invite you to get in touch, to get in touch with Glenda Faustino, with Chris and Tommy. And I think there are a lot of opportunities there for collaboration and for sharing all of the lessons you've learned along the way. And so I know that you can share with everyone else your advice to anyone who needs to work. And so we know we need that analysis, that purpose, and that nothing without us for us without us. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for, for allowing us to share this space, which is so wonderful for all. Thank you very much.